we looked at our data of patients that were treated with a trigeminal myalgia using an endoscope, and those who had never had any previous surgery, 92% of them woke up from surgery pain-free. It's a very good number. If you read most of the published literature, it's about 80 to 85 percent. Five percent of the patients said their pain was improved but not completely gone, and only three percent of the patients said they had no improvement from the surgery. But these are people who you expect to find blood vessels. They have what's called typical trigeminal they have classic histories, you expect to see something. And we think that our numbers are so high here is because we're using the endoscope. And we think we're actually identifying some blood vessels that we would otherwise miss with the microscope. And we also believe we're getting a better decompression by using the endoscope as well because we can see around the nerve better to make sure that we're not just displacing the blood vessel around the nerve and, and contacting it in a different area. In the patients with atypical trigeminal neuralgia, about 57% of them woke up without any pain, 19% said they were improved, and 24% of them said they were no better. Again, for what's called atypical trigeminal neuralgia, these are also very good numbers. Um, but they will never be as good as they are for the patient with typical trigeminal neuralgia. Um, in the patients that had previous surgery, who using a microscope where they woke up and their pain wasn't better, when we took them back and, and did it with an endoscope, 57% of them woke up pain-free, 29% of them said they were markedly better, and 14% said that they still had pain. So again, it suggests the endoscope was finding something that the microscope wasn't. We'll just move along here a little bit. We've also used this for hemifacial spasm. Hemifacial spasm is a disorder where you get twitching of the face. It's very similar to blepharospasm, but it's not just twitching of the eye, it's actually twitching of the entire face. It too is thought to be due to a blood vessel pressing on the nerve, but instead of being the trigeminal nerve, it's the facial nerve, and so the treatment is identical for, as for trigeminal neuralgia, but you move the blood vessel off of the facial nerve as opposed to the trigeminal nerve. So we've done 35 patients with that. Um, we have 83% of patients who've had complete resolution within 10 days, um, which again is a very good number uh, for hemifacial spasm, and uh, another 7% that then proceed to get better over a period of six months. So 90% of our patients end up getting cured with the surgery with hemifacial spasm, which is, which is a very good number. You can also do tumors in the back of the head using the endoscope. Um, we've done seven acoustic neuromas. Now, we've treated many more acoustic neuromas than that, but most of the acoustic neuromas we treat, we use gamma knife for, or we're doing open, regular procedures for, because they're so large, we don't see a benefit of using, a, uh, of using the endoscope. We've also done 14 meningiomas using an endoscope in the posterior fossa. Most of them are pretty large tumors, more than three centimeters. Um, usually, if they're smaller, we'll treat them with gamma knife. And as far as vestibular schwannomas go, there are some people around the country that are using endoscopes to remove them. Uh, but in our opinion, size matters. Um, and in general, if you have a tumor that's small that would be perfect for an endoscope, it's more perfect for what we call gamma knife. So instead of doing surgery for them, we're doing a less invasive procedure, which I'll talk about at the very end, um, to avoid surgery altogether. And then if they have a very large tumor that you can't use this modality called gamma knife for, we find that the endoscope is probably not going to provide much benefit anyway. So there aren't really that many patients that we're using the endoscopes for for these tumors. Here's an example of three different acoustic neuromas. The one on the left is relatively small. It would be perfect to use an endoscope for, uh, but we would, we would treat that with what's called gamma knife because it could be done as an outpatient. Um, and uh, the cure rate from that using the gamma knife is about 94%. The one on the right is a very large acoustic neuroma. As soon as we would start to remove some of that tumor, their brain would become very relaxed and we'd be able to see more than everything we would need to see for the entire case, and the endoscope is not, probably, not going to provide us any more benefit than using a microscope, so we probably wouldn't use it. And then in the third case, this patient does have a fairly sizable acoustic neuroma. Perhaps you could use an endoscope for it, but the tumor is actually growing fairly out into what's called the internal auditory canal, and I know that if I used an endoscope and did what we call a retrosigmoid approach to a, a get it, we're not going to be able to remove all the tumor that way. So we would use what's called a translabyrinthine approach where you actually drill out all the bone, and when you do that, there's no need for an endoscope either. So there are very limited indications for using an endoscope for acoustic neuromas, and we haven't used one. This is a different story. This is a patient with a petroclival meningioma. They had uh, facial numbness and facial pain. They had facial twitching, and they had double vision. And this is perfect for using an endoscope for because it's not a huge tumor. It's in a delicate location, and we don't have much room. And so, basically, the approach is the same as we would use for trigeminal neuralgia or hemifacial spasm, same exposure. 
But here we are, the endoscope is docked up. This is the tentorium. Here we are using both hands to, to debulk and remove the tumor. You can kind of see the seventh and eighth cranial nerve at the bottom here. And you basically are using the endoscope to dissect the tumor away uh, and, and remove it. And you get great visualization um, of, of all the important structures. And you can move the endoscope in and out uh, to remove the tumor just like you would uh, if it was trigeminalgia. We also are able to use, this is called a CUSA. It's an ultrasonic aspirator that basically vaporizes the tumor and then sucks it up. All right, so this is the post-op image in that very same patient. You can barely tell that anything, that they ever had any surgery. You basically see a little hole where, where the tumor was. Uh, the patient did great. They went home after three days from the surgery. Endoscope is fantastic for tumors like epidermoids. These are very soft tumors. They're like jelly. Um, you put the endoscope in there and they suck right out. The endoscope is fantastic. Those patients usually go home within a day. You could also use it for arachnoid cysts. The big question is whether or not you ever need to do surgery for arachnoid cysts. A majority of arachnoid cysts are merely birthmarks. We find them. Patients have them since birth. They live their entire life with them. They don't cause any symptoms. On a rare occasion, they might. We've had three patients that we thought it might be causing symptoms. One patient who had one um, near their um, vestibular cochlear nerve, they developed acute hearing loss, and they had an arachnoid cyst that was displacing the complex. We said maybe that's causing it. We fenestrated, drained the cyst to see if their hearing got better. It didn't, but it was an easy enough procedure for them. Um, they did well. Uh, the other patient was having vertigo with a toxic gait with another cerebellar pontine angle arachnoid cyst. That patient we fenestrated. They actually did get better from the procedure and have done well since. Um, and then we had one patient that had horrible intractable headaches, Mark. Uh, horrible, horrible headaches and arachnoid cysts. We saw them initially, said it's not the cyst, don't worry about it. They came back a year later with another MRI. The cyst was twice the size. So we removed the cyst, still had headaches. Um, but uh, some people believe that if you drain these cysts, the headaches can get better. Um, yeah, so, so rarely. And so if you think that that's the case, then it's, it's a very easy thing to do. You can use this for cerebellar tumors, fourth ventricular tumors. It's actually very nice for fourth ventricular tumors. So you can make a little incision in the very back of the head, make a, a one-inch opening in the base of the cerebellum. These are the type of tumors. This is a giant arachnoid cyst in the fourth ventricle, which was causing hydrocephalus, which you do need to fenestrate. Again, an endoscope is perfect. You just need a little thing in there to open up the cyst, and you're done. You don't need any huge exposures. Um, this patient had a large epidermoid tumor. Again, they're very soft tumors, and all you need is an exposure, and they, they come out very easily. And this last patient, uh, I believe, was an ependymoma uh, involving their fourth ventricle that we're able to use an endoscope as well. So, this is the kind of view you get when you first open up, and then once you remove the tumor, you've got, a, you've got a great view. You're looking all the way through the top of the fourth ventricle, actually looking into what's called the aqueduct of sylvius, uh, going up into the third ventricle. So the, the, the anatomy it provides you is, is fantastic. You also can do what is called image-guided endoscopic interventricular tumors. Um, and these are for things like pineal region tumors, colloid cyst, arachnoid cyst craniopharyngiomas and dermoids, tumors that are in the center of the brain sitting in the ventricles. It's a very difficult area to get to, um, but what we use is what's called a brain port. Um, and so in the old days, what you would do is you'd make a big incision in the head, you'd open up the brain, you actually cut part of the brain, retract part of the brain to get to the middle of the brain to get to the tumor. Nowadays, what we're using is we're using this neuronavigation, that GPS system. We're lining a specific trajectory to get down to where this area is. And we're using these little tubes. They're called brain ports. 